Welcome to Coffee with the Candidates, Round 2, The Road to the General. This second portion of the program will feature candidates vying for public offices in the Guam Legislature, the Attorney General's seat, Congressional Delegate, and the top seats of Governor and Lieutenant Governor of Guam. Two senatorial Democrat hopefuls will sit and share their stance and beliefs on some of Guam's hottest topics. Stay right there as Dr. Kelly Marsh Titano and Lucia Casil will be on set. Hi, for day. My name is Pauly X Suba of Cat FM, and you are watching Coffee with the Candidates. I have with me this time around Dr. Kelly Marsh. Thanks so much for uh, hanging out with me, having some coffee. Oh, absolutely. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Now, Dr. Kelly Marsh, off, uh, when we first met, I just wanted to uh, just let everybody else know uh, that's, that's watching that uh, you are married to uh, Mr. Titano. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, he kind of likes it when I mention that. Right. <laughs> it, it's it's kind of cool because uh, my wife uh, also says that uh, she wants to pursue being a doctor, but when that happens, she's going to legally change her name back to Luhan because it's her that's going through through the whole doctorate's uh, program. Right. And so I'm kind of like, I don't know about that. I'm kind of yeah. there are some options. hesitant about that. I, I know how she feels mm -hmm. because like when I've written academic papers, mm -hmm. it's been important to have that consistency. I was Kelly Marsh then, I'm Kelly right. Marsh now. But also the what I've tried to pitch to my husband, and you're of a younger generation, so it might work for okay. you guys, is I've tried to convince him to adopt be Mr. Marsh Titano and I will be Mrs. Marsh Titano. Or we can reverse it like sure. I'm Marsh Titano, he's Titano Marsh, but it hasn't flown for him. <laughs> but there's a possibility <laughs> for you and your wife. Okay, well I'll definitely talk to her about it more. <laughs> uh, since, since we are talking about that, was that something that you've always wanted to pursue? Like getting your doctorates and stuff like that? Or was there ever a time where I just want my bachelor's and I'm done? Well, that's a good question. Um, it really has been quite a journey for me, this mm -hmm. whole educational experience. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, once I embarked on it, I started to realize, like I started off, well, I thought, I thought it was going to be a PE teacher, but then it became this love of history and it became wow. this love of cultures mm -hmm. and this love of our region. And it kept on expanding. And so right. part of what I really wanted to do was to be able to I just, I, I love teaching, I love interacting with um, our youth, with our community, and so continuing that educational journey, getting to know a little bit more and a little bit more was really important to me because what you learn certainly is anytime you've made it to a certain point, there's always more mm. to, to learn and uh, everything is so complex. So I just kept on seeing those goals uh, ahead of me sure. and just kept on reaching for them. Yeah. Nice. Um, be, the fact that uh, you come from an uh, educational family, right? A, a bunch of e educators, right? You come from, was that what also um, inspired you to just keep going? I think that was part of why I wanted to be an educator mm -hmm. from the beginning, like mm -hmm. I said, P maybe a PE uh, teacher. But um, I, I think it was just this inner desire. I mean, I'm the first one in my immediate family that's gotten doctorate. Okay. And so my parents have continued their education. Um, my father mm. almost got a master's degree. You know, it's like all, all but the actual writing right. of the the thesis. And so I think for me, it's just, like I said, it's kind of like um, this puzzle or this, um, this thing to solve. Mm. And so you know that every time you learn a little bit more or another layer, you're getting to a, a, a deeper understanding mm. of all the complexities and trying to sort things out. And so for me, I try to, I try to tell my students, I'm like, okay, it's kind of like CSI. Okay. <laughs> But it's the history and the anthropology and, and Micronesian studies version sure. where, you know, you've, you've got uh, this person here and that event there and you try to draw the lines and put it all together and then come to some final analysis. Interesting. Uh, you came to the island when you were two years old. Yes. 
Uh, do yes. you vaguely remember the flight in and stuff? No, absolutely not. Right. I think my first real memories were about when I was four. <laughs> so the village that you guys first went uh, lived in? The first place that we lived in, the teacher's housing at the time was at Punta dos Amantes or the Two Lovers Point. Okay. There was some wooden housing there wow. that's no longer there. Yeah. And so we lived there. My father, he had actually been here before. Mm. We had family here that was here already. And um, he had gone to the Guam Territorial College. Okay. But his first teaching job was at Dedido Junior High back yeah. in the day. That's got to yeah. be kind of cool to tell people that you lived at Two Lovers Point. Yeah, when yeah. there was housing there. Wow, yeah. I didn't even know that. Uh, so s some of the other things that we might not know, um, you're so involved in so many different organizations. Can you go ahead and share a little bit about that information? Well, like I said, I love the things that I do. And mm. so I try to do a lot of community outreach. Okay. Um, I work with the Guam Preservation Trust. Mm. We partner sometimes. And so one of the things I've done is I've started a class. I've developed it at the University, excuse me, of Guam called Fatina Silati. And so, you know, I was a student at the University of Guam. Okay. And I had taken all of these history and anthropology and archaeology sorts of classes. Mm. And I had always been thinking along the way of like, okay, it's wonderful the theories that we have, but where's the hands-on experimentation to test those theories? Okay. And so when I was a senior at UOG, I had a pottery, an ancient Chamorro pottery replication class that I formulated by myself. It was a class of one. <laughs> I, tried, <laughs> I, tried to one. I tried to convince some others That's to awesome. join me. Okay. But um, I did at least convince some friends to go around and, and look for clay sources with me and things. Sure. But that's another class. Um, after this Laddie carving class, is, it's now been running for three years. It's going into its fourth year. Mm -hmm. So after that's up and running, uh, it, it's always been in my mind to maybe go back to that ancient pottery replication class okay. and take people out there to see if we can replicate. I mean, when you go around the island, there's pottery everywhere. Oh, yes, definitely. Right? Right, yeah. Um, pottery was so prolific here for thousands mm. of years. And so it's interesting to me that we don't have that solved. Like, we don't right. understand what clay they used and all of those yeah. issues. So. Um, Tracing back um, the Fatina Silati class, uh, maybe a pottery replication class, but the question was? Well, so, some of the organizations that you're a part oh, okay. of. Okay, yeah. Like so Pratehi, that's some of my work Pratehi, at, Zen, right? at the university, mm -hmm. right? And some of the partnering mm -hmm. I do with the Historic Preservation Office and the Guam Preservation Trust. But, um, you know, one of the things that I teach in critical thinking is they say it's important to be a critical thinker. Sure. But a part of it actually is going out there and then being active, mm -hmm. like taking those words and thoughts and then putting them into action. And so I've long been an advocate out there. Um, it's been a real interesting experience um, going out there uh, with signs, waving or standing up for something. Uh, that's been really important to mm -hmm. me. And so with that, some of what I've done has been uh, being there in the early days, so a uh, founding member of a sorts with Protehi Litex and okay. uh, Protect Rutidian right. or Save Rutidian. Sorry. I am just amazed by your passion for this island because <coughs> you have no other connection with Guam, right? Besides just the fact that your parents come out here to teach. Like, you, your bloodline doesn't, doesn't, uh, isn't right. here on Guam? I, I find it kind of interesting, you know, I. I think maybe it's because I teach history of Guam with such passion. I mean, I do mm -hmm. care so much that students at the end of the semester have asked me if I'm Chamorro. And, um, you speak Chamorro. A DDD. A <laughs> More bit. than me, though. More than me. I saw bit. a little video that you shared on, your, on Facebook, and you introduced yourself in Chamorro and such. Right, so I, I can speak a little, and my goal is to try to get back to speaking more. I have sure. had better fluency in the past, and one of the things that I thought was so cool was when I was taking these classes at the university, so it was very intensive, right, mm. is I actually had some very simple dreams, but mm. dreams in tomorrow, and I had never even thought of that as right. a possibility. I thought that was so cool. Yeah. 
But yeah, it's just, um, you know, being here, being such a part of the community, I think part of it also has been that I've lived in several villages. You know, one of the things I thought was kind of funny yeah. was uh, it, it was a little bit like this was your life, right? So as we were going and having these village meetings uh -huh. throughout the island, and so I would get to uh, Dededo and I'd be like, some of my earliest years were in Dededo here. I walked <laughs> to Maria Joa and Weddingale. But then we would go down to Inalahan, mm. and I'd be like, you know, I spent some of my childhood here in Inalahan. I was like, wow, how many villages have I lived in? I've, I've lived in wow. quite a few. But I think part of what I really like about that is it got me to, to understand more of the island, mm. see more of the community, and um, just be really immersed in a lot of ways. Uh, I'm just... Ha I'm just enjoying our conversation so much. We're almost done. Uh, your slogan here is community, culture, environment. Yes. That's what you're going to be. That's your platform on yes. becoming a senator for the 35th legislature. Can you just briefly share about what that means to you and your platform? Well, so much ties into it, really. Um, it it, it kind of ties into the idea that it's getting to these long-term solutions, mm. which are at the, the root of our identity and the root of our right. connection to the land. And so if we're building up uh, the land, we're keeping it healthy, we're keeping it special, we're coming together as a community, we're building bridges, we're helping each other mm -hmm. solve these problems, um, we're reaching out to those various community lever leaders who are out right. there, and we're working together to solve problems, things like that, we're developing uh, ecotourism and grassroots tourism, cultural tourism, all of those things together, they're really about strengthening our sense of ourselves, right. strengthening our connection to the island. And to me, I mean, it's just like a win, 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 win. <laughs> right. Where it keeps everything healthy, healthy. And those actually give us some of the tools to go out there and make some better choices, like for our youth who might mm -hmm. be really struggling right now with um, temptations of, you know, experimenting right. with drugs, or we have really high suicide rates. So these are the kind of things that I'm, I'm hoping will work at helping them build up self-esteem to be able to combat those kind of right. issues. Well, I'm, hope, I'm hoping for, uh, for the 35th legislature that you do win as well in that uh, aspect. My name again is Pauli X Suba of cat fm thank you so much dr marsh for uh having some coffee with me here yes it's and, posse. Uh, i i look forward in uh seeing what you have to offer the island of guam your number in i am number five. number five so if you want to help me out we're going to do a high five, <laughs> number five. for there number five <laughs> once again um we are coffee with the candidates right here and coming up next we have miss casil also vying for your votes in the 35th legislature. Hafiday, welcome back to Coffee with the Candidates. My name is Pauli Suba of CAT FM, and I am now with Lassia Casil. Hafiday, everyone. Thank you for having me, Polly. So uh, a little bit about yourself, you're a small business owner, uh, you come from a military family background, you moved back in at, when you were 19? Um, initially I mm. did move back to Guam when I was 19. Right. Um, I lived here for a couple of years and then I left um, for about 20 something years and recently moved back five years ago. Right. I think a lot of people can relate to the fact that they're part of a military family have a lot of people on Guam that have joined uh, all different branches of the military. Uh, care to uh, those experiences that that you've had growing up being in a military family, care to elaborate on how that can help you become a leader here on this island? Oh absolutely, you know I moved uh, just about every two years of my life mm -hmm. experiencing new people, new cultures, mm -hmm. new ways of thinking, um, you know, when you travel that much, you mm. have to kind of live outside the box, think outside the box. Sure. And it teaches you how to adapt very mm. quickly and to, to, you know, mold yourself to your surroundings instead of the other way around. Right, Lassia, so 
you come you come here at 19 years old do you already have kind of an idea of how the island it, it is and how it, how you imagined it it was supposed to be oh uh, sure I, I i lived you know my my first six years on guam mm -hmm. um living in agate hey you know? yeah <laughs> um half a day agate viva agate um you know on my grandmother's ranch right there near the, the okay. river um, I learned how to swim here, and you know when my father joined the military, it took us abroad. But summers we would come home, mm -hmm. you know, for family reunions, mm -hmm. um, deaths in the family. Mm -hmm. We'd we would you know so there was always that connection. Right. Yes. Did you have like a Ford with the Chamorro Pride sticker in the back? Um, it, back then, right. 19? No, no. No, 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 like what, in your family and such. Uh, every time I go to the States, we go to like oh. celebration. You, you look at the parking lot and everybody has like island pride. Oh, yes, yes, pride we did sticker. have those type of things, right. you know, yeah, yeah, in our home, yeah. Yeah, so you come back at 19 and uh, are, there, are there certain things that, uh, that you love, certain things that maybe that you hope to change about the island of Guam? And, and make better, or did it? Does it come later on in life? Well, initially, when I first came to Guam, mm. um, I was studying at a university in Munich, Germany, and it was my dream to come home and be, become a teacher. Okay. So when I got here, you know, I, I tried to pursue that mm. that avenue, and it didn't work out. Um, really. You know, I was met with discrimination, and. Um, it was really difficult for me to find a job back then. Discrimination because you you didn't grow up here. No discrimination because I, I identify as transgender. Okay. Um, you know there was that LGBT discrimination sure. in the late eighties nineties. You know LGBTQ people were still very closeted here in Guam. Okay. Um, and you know people the families just were very hush hush about about mm. those type of things. And so I left the island. And, and okay. I think we still have that problem, you know, over the past 20 years, mm -hmm. that brain drain, mm, you know, yes. of, of people that are, and it's not just LGBTQ people, you know, it's, it's women, minorities, um, other ethnicities here on the island that right. have been discriminated against and felt bullied mm. and that have left the island. Very mm -hmm. talented people. Sure. Yeah. So what was it that drove you that, that, uh, gave you the courage, I guess, to come back here? Well, I told myself that I would never come back home unless I had my own business and I could be my own boss and mm. no one could ever fire me again. And um, I did that. Mm. I opened up my own jewelry line um, after many years of working in corporate real estate in New York City. All right. Um, and DFS offered to take my line. Oh, nice. And, you know, I was just overjoyed with that right. to, to finally fulfill that dream of coming right. home and being my own boss and, and, you know, the master of my own destiny. Right. Uh, so, some people, um, politics is something that they, they want to pursue right away. Uh, it doesn't sound like politics has been something that you wanted to pursue. No, I definitely don't want to be a career politician. Okay. Absolutely not. But do I believe in my platform, equality for all? Okay. Yes. Do I believe in responsible economy? And I believe in protecting our environment. Okay. And I have, in the past few years, um, taken the initiative uh, to start uh, Found Save Southern Guam. Okay. Um, you know, which is, uh, our mission is to advocate for protecting the beauty of the southern coastline uh, and the environment of Southern Guam. Um, I advocate for LGBT rights and equality. Right. You know, I started the, the, the annual Guam Pride March and we're in our second season. Next year will be our third season. Okay. And, um, you know, there were just all these injustices that I felt um, uh, when I came back home mm. that I, I just, witnessed and I, I and I felt like I needed to step up sure. and do something about that. Sure. Is there is it lack of leadership on this island <laughs> that you feel like you that uh, you need to take a more leadership role? Well, it, uh, I mean, th that's definitely one of one of the uh, mm -hmm. the, the points. 
um, lack of leadership, lack of accountability, lack of mm. transparency in our government. Um, for instance, with Save Southern Guam, mm. you know, my, my decade long experience of working in corporate real estate in New York, you know, I, I knew of these mechanisms, uh, you know, when, when engaging the community, working on de huge development projects. Okay. And we didn't have that here, it, you know, with the Pago Bay project. Mm -hmm. uh, the community said that they didn't want it, and still the Guam Land Use Commission gave the variance for that. Mm. Um, with the project in Agate, um, it was announced in the, in the newspaper on the front page that they were going to build this hotel, and that would never happen in the U.S. Um, because there are these steps, processes, sure. you know, that you take when you're going to build something like a huge 15-story hotel in the middle of a village. Mm. You know, first you go to the community. Mm -hmm. you, you know, you engage in them and you get feedback from them on, on, on the environment, how mm -hmm. it's going to impact, impact that, the traffic, um, utilities, mm -hmm. and none of those studies were done. Right. Um, they just came in and said, we're going to build a hotel here. Wow. And you know, my experience was that th this is not the, the proper way. Sure. And when we took the Guam Land Use Commission to court, um, I discovered that those processes don't even exist here. Wow. So I want to um, get into the legislature and implement those processes that, that, that will check and balance, um, right. you know, our, our, our Department of Land. Right. So that specific department, land, it's kind of a, a niche for me, you know, sure. it's, a, it's a passion project and mm -hmm. I want to make sure that um, we preserve as much land, what little we have left, right? you know, because our culture is derived from the land, our right. culture is derived from the ocean, and when we don't have any of that left, mm -hmm. our culture is going to disappear. It seems like you, you've already taken leadership roles even without having to ha be a senator and, and such, which I commend you for that uh, very much so. So if you were to become senator in the 35th legislature, are these, besides uh, taking on that passion, passionate role, uh, what else do you plan on doing in the next two years? Um, well, I would like to expand um, our, uh, our tourism base. Okay. Um, with Guam Pride, um, I met with the Guam Visitors Bureau a year and a half ago they, they actually approached me. Okay. Um, they wanted to tap into a multi-billion dollar tourism market, the LGBT tourism market. We don't have that market here mm. yet on Guam. Uh, it's a multi-billion dollar market. Sure. Um, just the population of China alone, 65 million LGBT people. It's larger than the entire population of France. So that's a lot of money. Yes. Yes. Um, in 2016, there were, uh, I believe, $12.5 uh, billion in tourism receipts from 125 million uh, uh, LGBT tourists in this, in this area. Mm -hmm. If we could just tap into 1% of that, For sure. you know, it would be $125 million uh, of additional revenue for our island. We already have uh, these industries for, same, for, for marriage. We can just expand it to same-sex marriage, sure. you know? And we're in this unique position where we are located, Guam. Mm -hmm. um, if you look at all of our surrounding, uh, the countries, the Philippines, um, Japan, Singapore, Vietnam, um, Indonesia, it's still illegal to be L identify as LGBTQ in all these countries. People can't get married. Mm -hmm. People are still put to death. All we have to do is open our, open our arms and welcome these people and say, this Guam is a safe place for mm. you to come, get married, vacation, um, walk down the street with your partner holding your, your hands. Mm. You know, I, the gay dollar is the same color as the straight <laughs> dollar. Yes. So right. um, th that's my mission with, with Guam Pride. Right. And, and I hope that we can dedicate more resources to right. tapping into this market because the other markets are, you know, that they're, they're right. fluctuating. We're yeah, we've tapped them out. Right. And, and this is a market that hasn't been um, fully developed here on this island. And, and we're in this very unique position. 
Yep. I, I want to thank you, Lassia, for everything that you've already done for the <laughs> island of Guam. You are on the ballot at number... I am currently number nine. Number nine. On the Democratic ticket. All yes. right. I wish you well. Thank you so much again for joining me here on uh, Coffee oh. with the Candidates. Thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And um, I, I, everyone, thank you so much. I humbly ask for your vote. Lassia Casale, number nine. Thank you so this is Coffee with the Candidates. We also want to thank Dr. Marsh. She was, uh, I interviewed her first before Lassia. Thank you again. You're tuned in to Coffee with the Candidates. My name is Polly Suba on CAT-FM.